store. Um, also, we are recording this event and later posting it onto our YouTube channel. Um, if uh, you have a question for our authors tonight, please type it in the chat and Rachel and I will take turns um, asking it for you. Yes, you can, any questions you have that come up throughout the event, you can pose them in the chat box at any time. And then at the end of the event, Davis and I will have collected them and we'll start um, asking them then. You can also send questions to either one of us as a direct message if that's simple. Um, in terms of the recording, just so, so you're not worried about that, the recording will only pick up those of us who are unmuted and inside the yellow box. Um, as long as you stay muted, you will not be uh, recorded in the YouTube video. Um, so that's the boring stuff. Um, tonight, I get to introduce our guest authors. Um, Krista Paravani is the best-selling author of Her, a memoir. She's taught at Dartmouth College, UMass Amherst, SUNY Purchased, West Virginia University, where she served as assistant professor of creative nonfiction. She's with us this evening to talk about her new memoir, Loved and Wanted, a memoir of choice, children, and womanhood, which I'm about 30 pages into, and I'm finding the writing absolutely gorgeous. So I'm really thrilled to have her here this evening. Um, and then joining us this evening to interview Krista is Merit Tierce, the author of the Northshire staff favorite, Love Me Back, and a National Book Award Foundation Five Under, five, five under 35 honoree. Um, I'm so pleased to have them both here tonight. Thank, please join me in welcoming them to the Northshire. And Krista, why don't you take it away by sharing a little bit of Loved and Wanted with us? Uh, thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you for having me. This is the closest that I'm going to get to my hometown bookstore, <laughs> and I am so pleased to be here. And Merit, thank you. Uh, Merit is my only friend that I have ever met over Zoom. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is totally appropriate that we're yes. having right now. Yes, we were set yeah. up on a Zoom date, and we just hit it off, and I am mm -hmm. so pleased to be able to talk to you, Merit, about this book. I so admire your novel. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to read a little bit um, from the beginning of the book, and um, we'll go from there. It was the last day of my old life, the third week of October, the year I turned 40. Joe was at school. Iris was at daycare. I didn't know where my husband, Tony, was. It's peculiar what I can't forget. Our bathroom held the sickeningly sweet smell of geranium scented cleaner. I wore pants and not a dress, socks but no shoes, a too tight blouse, unwashed hair pinned in a bun above my neck. I sat against a wall where the taupe paint was scratched an uncapped EPT developing in my grip. I held the test upside down. I couldn't bear to watch. A gap between the door set a rectangle of yellow light across the tub. Two minutes to know what would become of me. Time passed, a whole life. I flipped the EPT over when waiting got harder than knowing. Two red lines and a white strip stared at me. A second test lay in the box. I ripped its foil package open with my teeth. Right between the sink and the commode, I crouched down, swearing in disbelief. I was still breastfeeding 12-month-old Iris, still recovering from pregnancy and birth, still lonely the way a mother is when she can't find the person she used to be. I knew when it happened. The deaths of our fathers had brought us close. Tony and I had fumbled to find each other in our unlit bedroom. He reached for me and I held him. There are people in life you feel you've known before. I've never met Tony. He's a big man, a strong man. He weighs 100 pounds more than me. His eyes are blue, so clear and blue, they seem empty and foreign and unreadable. He's a combat veteran marked emotionally with scars of bullets he survived. Tony prefers life to be raw and unpredictable and intoxicating with risk, or so the years of our marriage tell. Tony's father was dead. He didn't know how to say how much loss hurt. We fucked sweetly in our bed. He didn't pull out. I didn't ask him to. When he comes, he unravels. The wall between us drops for a few miraculous seconds. 
I'd wanted to please Tony. I'd demonstrate my love by taking all of him. I'd been careless and stupid. Two more red lines. I threw the test across the bathroom. Of course, it hit the tile, flying back at me. Our situation was disconcerting. We couldn't afford another baby. We were like most Americans. No savings, no emergency fund, lots of debt, lots and lots. Professors at West Virginia University. Tony and I held the exact same position. Identical jobs. Tony made more than I did. And he didn't even want the job. He was always trying to quit, looking for shinier work, Hollywood writing work. Like so many women, my money was earmarked to look after the children. 70% of what I took home would go to childcare if I could find it, which I didn't think we could if we had another baby. It had taken a year and a half for a spot to open in a good daycare for Iris. Not an uncommon thing in small towns. Demand exceeds supply. There were so few options. I'd placed Iris on several waiting lists six weeks into my first trimester. Each one was the same. Write your name on a line and pray. Most household tasks and chores fell on me. Night feedings, bills, boring paperwork. Someone always needed to be fed or rocked or talked off the ledge of a tantrum. I didn't have time to be pregnant. I divvied minutes. The night before I took the EPT, Tony stood in the living room and lifted our upright Dyson by its handle, looking it over as if it were some rare thing. He tried to unlock the detachable hose, squeezing it. Seven years we'd owned that vacuum cleaner. And then Tony asked me how to turn it on. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. I, um, I just think this book is so important. Congratulations on the publication of it, and thank you for writing it. I think uh, it is a very, very special book and, uh, and unique in the canon of abortion books, which there aren't enough of. Um, but, and so I'm just thrilled to, uh, to be here talking to you about it. And that is such a powerful opening. I'm glad that's what you chose to read. I think uh, everything that the book is about is is in there and it just really punches you, grabs you, doesn't let go. And uh, so everyone who's here, should, you should definitely buy it and read it. Um, and, uh, and so I think um, uh, I, so, okay. So it, there's two things that, um, in the in the in the very beginning of this book that that are both there um so wonderfully one of them is um something that i feel like is uh i feel like it goes to the heart of what i feel like is one of the most dangerous and um and persistent collective myths that we all have about abortion which is that uh, that there are people who are mothers or parents and there are people who have abortions and uh, that's just not true and uh, the, so what I love about your book is that um, it, it just really uh, presents the complexity of this of how uh, the choice to have an abortion or continue a pregnancy it always lands in the middle of, of the web of circumstances that is your life it's not like it's an isolated, free-floating decision in a vacuum, ever, <laughs> speaking of vacuums. Um, and I think that it's so important, and we just need more writing and more conversation about that. Um, but then the other thing that I love about this is that it, we're immediately in, uh, the, in the reality of how difficult it is to access abortion in the United States. Um, and uh, so I think that especially with Ginsburg's death and... Um, and the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett, like even in the the just popular, just the, the regular person's mind, you don't have to be concerned with abortion or reproductive rights to to be aware of the headlines now that mm -hmm. abortion is really imperiled, that Roe is in danger. But what your book does is lay out how that's kind of not the point. Access is already over in so many places that it's it 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 almost doesn't matter that. Uh, Roe could be overturned because so many people are already having such trouble accessing abortion. So um, 
those are just my two like thank you thoughts. Thank you for writing this book and my my uh, telling everyone who's listening why I think it's so important. Um, but then, so I just, there's a part later in the book where you say, I can both want to have had reasonable access to abortion and love and want my son. Choice bolsters the miraculous attachment we have to our babies. And I think that is just such a beautiful distillation of, of this reality. So I would love to hear you talk about that, about um, how choice bolsters the attachment we have to our babies. Oh, that's a really good question. And I'm going to, my heart is beating hard. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm just going to be slow. <laughs> um, Do it. No. There was, I, well, first of all, uh, I mean, the majority of people here haven't read the book, obviously. Merit has, she so graciously blurbed it. Um, the book, you know, the premise of the book is uh, delivered on a taboo, which is I wanted an abortion and I couldn't get one. And that was because I lived in the state of West Virginia where I had moved with my family um, in 2015 um, for a teaching job at West Virginia University where um, I do still teach creative nonfiction. Um, it was a great job with not uh, good enough pay, but it offered our family some stability. And um, we had one child there then when we moved, uh, Josephine, who's now nine. and. Um, I really, you know, I grew up with a sister and I always wanted um, a family. I wanted a sibling for my daughter. And um, we were so lucky to be able to uh, welcome a second child into our family, Iris. And um, I thought I was finished having children. I was 40 years old. I was in this competitive job. I had another book that I really wanted to write. And um, Iris was just had just turned a year old and I had started noticing that I wasn't feeling well at all uh, before her birthday and I just thought why am I why am I gaining weight why why am I sick all the time oh I who knows <laughs> I don't know why it didn't occur to me that I was pregnant I was <laughs> so um I you know I soon found out that I was I was pregnant with a third child and I really I didn't know how we were going to afford that baby I didn't and um it was a painful moment for me because I wanted that family and uh, I could, it was hard to reconcile the fact that I couldn't afford a third child. So I did in fact seek out an abortion and um, you know, I didn't know this then, but I know it now, which is that more than half of women who have an abortion already have children and they have mm -hmm. an abortion because they can't afford to take care of the children they have if they welcome another person into their family. And that is a complex choice, you know, it's not, it's not one that's not made without, I mean, and for me at least, and, I, and I'm just imagining what it's like to be another mother who's not me in that situation, that it's a heartbreaking moment. And um, it was a moment that I felt I had, I, you know, I had, I had to choose that because I just, I couldn't make the numbers work. And um, I looked into my options and I noted, I, you know, I noted that there was one reproductive health clinic in the entirety of West Virginia and it was very far from my house and it required lots of waiting periods and I couldn't, you know, there was no way to do it. And there was a way in which the system there, when you're set up with barriers to get reproductive health care, you know, you're, you're, you're going to have to drive all this way, you're going to have to get a hotel, you're going to have to find someone to take care of the kids you already have, you're being told right then and there, that what you want is shameful. And so mm -hmm. I did not realize then because I was in the middle of it, that a lot of the decision making that I had at that moment was influenced by that shame. It was influenced by the shame that I did not know what was best for my family. And I really believe that when we empower women to be able to make their own decisions, that they are much more able to parent with confidence. And that, that feeling is echoed in this really fantastic study called the Turnaway Study. It's a book that came out recently. It's a, a, a research study in the, you know, that was 10 years in the making that studied women who had had uh, who had been denied access to abortion care. And it found that those women were more likely to suffer depression, physical issues, unemployment for years. But the thing is that their children were much more likely to suffer from having um, slow learning in school, dental health problems, 
homelessness, poverty, incarceration. And I, I, I understand it now in my bones that, that, you know, obviously you're disabled when you do not have the money to take care of your family. You are also disabled when you have a mother who is to care for you, who is told that she is, does not matter enough to be able to make the decisions that she knows will deliver a good life for her family. And so that's where that came from. You know, mm -hmm. I think had I been provided with a salary that was high enough to pay for daycare, had I been had it been easier for me to be a woman in this country, it might have been an easier decision for me to have welcomed that third child into our family without apprehension and terror, frankly, but that's not what happened. And in order for us to be able to allow our mothers to be able to greet their children with that kind of confidence, we need to provide for them. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes to everything you just said. Um, I'm glad you brought up the Turnaway study because I, I also think anyone who's interested in your book would find that book to be um, really riveting as well. Uh, the audio book version of it is very well done if you're into that. Um, but so, something that I, I found so heartbreaking that was a, a finding of the Turnaway study was that um, it is, they actually, you know, found that it's harder for people to bond with their babies when they are forced to continue a pregnancy they wanted to abort. And that is just, how does anyone think that's good for the baby or the woman uh, or the mother? Um, and and it also, uh, some another important finding of the Turnaway study that really resonates with your experience, I think, um, as borne out in your book, is that it is such a practical thing. I think we really want it to be romantic, uh, or at least the anti-choice forces, the far right that wants to restrict access to abortion, um, or anyone who is just maybe not so informed about what leads to the choice to have an abortion may think that, you know, well, once you have the baby, everything will be fine. There's this romantic idea that, uh, that I don't know, that you can have unlimited children with limited finances, and that's just not true. And what the Turnaway study found was that what drives a lot of the decision making about uh, why people have an abortion is is financial, and I think that is so. You know, that's just it's just not exciting. It's like it's disappointing, or um, people want to perceive that as insufficient as a reason, and um, that's another reason I'm really glad you wrote this book because. It is such a real aspect of the choice to have children, and it's it's part of loving them is being able to provide for them. Um, so I'm glad uh, you said all that. And I, um, it, it something else you said uh, made me want to quote your book at you again. Um, <laughs> you said uh, oh, when you're talking about shame. So there's a line where you say that the barriers to abortion left you feeling um, that you'd done wrong. You had the sense of yourself as a person who wished to commit unspeakable acts. And I think that is, that is the experience that a lot of um, people who seek an abortion have. And it's such a bind, um, you know, that either uh, you, you carry the pregnancy to term and you carry the shame of not being able to provide for your child the way you wanted to, or you carry the shame of choosing abortion. And that just doesn't seem fair. And so much of that unfairness lands on the woman, the mother usually. Uh, and I, I think, um, yeah. So uh, speaking of that unfairness, um, I, I don't know if, so the New York Times review of your book <laughs> came out today and uh, and it, it, it works its way to uh, a commendation by the end where uh, it, it basically says, in spite of everything, you should read this book. But uh, it does something that I really, I was kind of disturbed by, and I wondered if you would be willing to talk about, which is that um, in a, early in the piece, in the second or third paragraph, it starts talking about, um, about uh, Tony, the father of your kids, and and invokes kind of his career and his celebrity, I think, in a way that I just felt like I didn't really understand why the author decided to do that. And uh, especially because in your book, you had deliberately raised that and laid it to rest. So I wondered if you wanted to talk about that a little bit. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, I will say, you know, I'm 
grateful to be able to have had the space and the in, in the review and she does of course of, she does uh, and so i don't i you know i know the rule which is that you don't complain about the review but it struck me though you know like what woman doesn't want her husband to have the second paragraph of her book review? <laughs> we're reviewing my book and then all of a sudden we're talking about the, you know, massive bestseller that Anthony Swafford had, which um, is fine for Anthony Swafford, but it's not the point of my book. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, in a way, I, I understand it. It's, it's kind of, it's how we wound up with Donald Trump as the president in some ways, you know, it's like... <laughs> It's, it's like I lived in Los Angeles for so long. It's irresistible to not touch fame. And I get why she wanted to do it, but it wasn't the place for, in my book review because in my opinion, this is, you know, like when you take um, a woman's husband and you put him in front and center and, you know, frankly, I'm asked all the time, like, what would, what would, what does Tony think about this book? What does Keats think about this book? I mean, I'm very concerned about what Keats thinks about this book, but you know, I'm being asked to answer for the men in my life uh, again and again, when, you know, the experience of being denied reproductive health care is mine. It's not his. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I feel that, you know, I felt like it was a little, it was a little unfair and it just sort of speaks to the culture of the ways in which we view women's writing. You know, I was worried about that. I, had avoided the subject of my marriage, soul, not solely, but for a large, a large reason was that I didn't want the conversation to be about my husband for, for many reasons. You know, one of them is if you introduce, you know, I know this is a writer and next time maybe I'll go to fiction. <laughs> I know that if you introduce somebody who is a, you know, a larger than life successful character and they're male and it's a marriage that takes the air out of the room in a way that I did not want to because my focus was on talking about the policies in this country that cause women to uh, not, you know, be able to climb the, career ladder that, you know, keep them home without childcare that have them unable to get reproductive care, you know, and also what that means for healthcare in general. And as interesting as my marriage was, I didn't think it was nearly as important as those things. And I didn't. Mm -hmm. want to so that was the yeah. aim. I'm, I understand it was irresistible. I'm sorry that it happened. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, me too. I mean, I, I guess I just wish that that space could have served several other purposes. I mean, I think one of them is, uh, and, and she touches on this a little bit, but I think it is really uh, unique the way that your book, um, I, I think it's a pretty deft combination of memoir and um, some reportage about the situation and and placing abortion in a healthcare context, which we don't do enough. It is either this polarizing political issue mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's been so effectively segregated from healthcare that I think people forget it is healthcare. And, mm -hmm. and your book is really uh, exploring that and, it, and exploring it in a way that um, includes, you know, the health, the, the health of your, uh, of, your daughters and the impact that like the larger system has on children. And um, I think that is, um, it's just so important to realize that it's a spectrum that, that abortion is part of this whole thing, that um, it is one, uh, it is one material reality of not being able to provide, you know, the best for your kids. So, um, so you mentioned something just now that I wanted to ask you about, which is, uh, which is, and, and so with my novel, what I did is, is I, I took the fiction route, um, which gives you certain freedoms, one certain freedom with working with the autobiographical material. And, um, but, uh, I mean, even so, and, and as a memoirist and a, teacher of uh of writers i just uh, i'm assuming you've had um you've thought about this a lot and or you've been asked quite often but um how do you think about or uh about this 
potential future conversation with Keith about uh, the book or how do you weigh those decisions about, um, you know, talking about your own life when it, in, it means talking about, you know, your children and other people uh, in writing? Well, I think, you know, the decision to write the book and the book itself, totally separate issues that I need, that I will need to address with my, you know, with my son, because I've decided to write this book. Although I do also believe that there is no way I, and I, and I, you know, I had this conversation with myself before I committed to writing the book, which is there was no way that Keats was going to be out of this house that I'm in here uh, as a grown man without knowing that this was an experience I had and not, and I'm actually a pretty private person. I mean, that's shocking to people since I write nonfiction, <laughs> but I am, <laughs> I really am. I don't, I don't, I don't go shouting my, my private life all over the place that way. Um, but there, there was no way that he wouldn't have been colored by that experience in some way. Um, one, because Josephine is old enough to remember that time. And she's asked me, you know, we, we left West Virginia and she said, mommy, do we not live here anymore because it hurts girls? And, you know, I had to say yes, that yes, mm -hmm. yes. So I know that, I know that she'll remember that. Um, and I, and she's his sister and it's a conversation that, that will be had. I mean, I have been a child in a house and been, then been a grown up who had many conversations <laughs> with my siblings. So I don't, I didn't want to, I, I, I didn't, I didn't want to protect him from something that I knew that he would know anyway. There's that, mm -hmm. that portion of it, but also, um, you know, I, would like to believe, and I've asked myself this question many, many times, just in my own life, you know, since I was in high school, and I'm, I'm sure, yeah, I imagine that you did too, if you were in a moment, and you could speak to something that would help people who, who were oppressed in some way, you would do it, right? Mm -hmm. I had to do it, because I knew that I had lived through something that was not, was under discussed, that even as a writer of nonfiction who, you know, I've written about rape, I've written about heroin use, I've written about it all and none of it, mm -hmm. you know, I've learned to be ashamed of none of it. This, this experience, it really rattled me. And I realized that was partially because it was so under discussed. And I, I felt that I needed to do it. Uh, I hope that my children will grow up and my daughters will say, I had a mother who fought for my reproductive rights, I, my health care, and my son will be proud that I was able to do that and not, not hurt by it. But also it strikes me, and you know, one of the things about sitting down to write this book is that it's really, you know, the catalyst for this book was not about me, it was about the life that I want for my children. I realized mm -hmm. that, you know, I really, Keats was born in the state that, you know, in state in West Virginia, but he was also born in a condition that was not, he was not healthy and his uh, uh, medical care was grossly inadequate. And I realized um, after doing some research that children born in states with curtailed reproductive health care have higher rates of infant mortality and child mortality and are far more likely to suffer all sorts of poverty. And um, I couldn't live with that knowledge that I hadn't said something about that either. You know, it wasn't about mm -hmm. me, it was about that. And I wanted to, I wanted to shed light on that because uh, it makes a lot of sense, but it's also really under discussed. But I do want to say this, like I watched, I don't know if you watched this, there's the, the Gloria Steinem Amazon. No, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> You, you haven't seen it yet okay you should no. <laughs> because okay. there's a moment and I think I think you'll understand this because I this kind of moment fills me with rage <laughs> but um you know like the moment when the woman is granted the abortion and this happens in the docuseries and uh, um in the, in the show and the doctor says to the woman who's playing you know Gloria Steinem make this matter you know and it always makes me cringe because we don't I don't I don't think we ought to give women the pressure to make an abortion matter. It's just a mm -hmm. choice we need to make. But I was thinking about it in terms of my children. You know, I've had the life I've had. I, I've, I've tried to do things that matter, but I knew that 
it raised in a family with financial constraints like that, that it was going to be hard for them to be able to live the lives that they wanted that mattered, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And that's the whole point that, that when you don't support women, their children are, are in, you know, in, in much difficult positions where they are far less likely to be able to reach the potential that they might have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. I think it is so under discussed and, and yet it's so your experience is not uncommon. I think this is what I want people to really understand from your book and, and why we need to, to write more and talk about it more is that, um, but I think what, what constrains us is that, um, there's just a, such a, a fear about having, uh, there's, it's almost a superstition. I mean, a, a taboo for sure about talking to kids about being wanted or unwanted as if it's some sort of fixed or absolute thing. And, and I really wonder why we're so afraid of that. I mean, even with all of the contraceptive methods that we have in the world right now, the, the worldwide, the un and unintended pregnancy rate is still about, I think it's like 44% worldwide, but it's pretty high. I mean, almost half of all pregnancies are unplanned. So uh, it's not like we're there yet. <laughs> With, I mean, chances are you weren't planned. It doesn't mean you aren't loved, you can't be loved, or you, you, know, you won't have a good life. They're not inherently connected. And so I think that it's worth something to, to you know, to allow a child to grapple with that complexity at some age, you know? Um, yeah. And I think, uh, oh, I wanted to ask you about the title because I think the title is going at this. And um, I just wanted to ask you to uh, explain it to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's just along the same, you know, the same line mm -hmm. as the conversation is going, but I, you know, the question that I pose to myself over and over again is what will you tell your son? And I thought I'm going mm -hmm. to, my son that he's loved and wanted and that's what he mm -hmm. it, you know the the my my desire for reproductive health care didn't change that and I you know I grew up in a house and my mother reminded me this the other day um you know she had an appointment to have an abortion when she was pregnant with me and she didn't go and I've known that my entire life and it meant nothing to me <laughs> I mean the weight of that you know you hear that's like mm -hmm. the possible thing that can happen. I mean, I don't know how I turned out, <laughs> but I'm just kidding. But, you know, but it didn't, it wasn't something that I lived my entire life feeling that there was something wrong with me or something wrong with my mother. I just felt like that was, a, that was what she needed. Mm -hmm. And that was a decision between her and herself. It had nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. And I never, yeah, I, I, I had forgotten about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that in, uh yeah uh it's in the, yeah so um it, i thought it was really cool that you included that and and that you knew that your whole life i think that um you know uh <laughs> i think it's really valuable to understand that our mothers are people and uh they're not you know and to and also i think what your book does in the in the opening that you read even is um remind you that your mother is a sexual being like you wouldn't be here if she weren't and uh i think that this is another myth of that somehow is so persistent that that uh and so retrograde like we think we're past these things but we're not we want women to be either mothers or sexual beings not both but that makes no sense like you can't be a mother without having first been a sexual being so yeah Thank you. So, and, you know, this occurs to me. I didn't, I've never thought of it this way, but maybe, you know, it's this radical idea that because I had a mother who was willing to tell me this, that I now can be the kind of mother who writes this book. I was mm -hmm. of the notion of that being a taboo in my life. And I was able to do, I was able to write this book because my mother showed me how little it had to do with me and how, I mean, I, I don't, you know, I, now I couldn't have done it without that. I couldn't, mm -hmm. I, I knew that I had not been mortally wounded in that way. 
she freed me with that confession. And, you know, I hope that I can do that for other people. I hope that this book does that. I hope they can pick this up and feel way less alone and that we can start having a conversation about our bodies this way and about our mm -hmm. sexuality, exactly what you're saying. Yeah, uh, I think that is a really important gift that your mom gave you. I mean, what it also, it turns this, these ideas about choice inside out in a way because you're forced to, to you know, evaluate her mothering separate from whether or not she planned you, wanted you, mm -hmm. sought an abortion, whatever. I mean, she, you're, she, your life with her is still your life with her. And to, to look back on it and know that she gave it to you the way she did as the person that she was, I think is really, really important and uh, grounding. So that's cool. I like your mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> uh huh. Um. So, uh, I think I also wanted to see if you wanted to talk about um a little bit about uh. There's a scene um in the book that I I love that I think uh is pretty. I don't know. Uh, I feel like I've encountered this uh, quite a few times. And um, let me see, I'll just read it. Uh, so women should be able to choose, my friend said, all in agreement, nervously chopping vegetables or fruit for the children. But I'd never do such a thing, never have an abortion. They sip their wine, needing to understand my story as merely a demonstration for the right. You didn't really want to terminate, I was told. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is that? I mean, what is that? This It just seems kind of weird to me to say women should be able to choose, but I could never do it. I mean, um, what is going on there? And why do people feel like they can tell you, like, you didn't really want what you say you wanted? I, you know, I think it's, I think it's, there are many facets to how complex that is. You know, one of them is just has to do with, um, I think in the situation that I was in, in West Virginia, which is the denial that there's the reality that it is that hard. You know, I think that it's easier to say, oh, you didn't really want that anyway, than it is to say, I don't have the choice here either. And mm -hmm. I, I think looking mm -hmm. at me and seeing that as a reality was not easy to digest because to do so would be an admissions of, admission of one's own powerlessness. And I was a reminder mm -hmm. of that, which was highly uncomfortable for everyone, including me. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, I think that's part of it. Um, I think too that uh, unless you've been faced with the necessity to terminate a pregnancy, which I have, I had a, an abortion when I was uh, 21 years old um, or about that at 20, um, it's hard to understand that uh, it, it could be something that has to happen. I mean, I think that without mm -hmm. having been in the situation, it's easy to have the moral judgment. It's also easy to say, oh yes, that should be fine, but it's not fine for me. When people do that though, they don't realize that they're just reinforcing the shame that exists, that we shouldn't be doing it in the first place. I think the, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not one of those people that should, tells anyone how they should feel about something, but I think in that position, it's probably better to listen than it is to chime in with that because, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't, I don't, I don't judge them. I understand it was highly uncomfortable, uh, but it was also just part of the structure that I think allows us to have these laws in the first place that says, no, I don't need that law, thank you. That's for you and that's not for me. When in reality, one never knows when they're going to need that law. Yeah, it's really true. And it, it leads to this exceptionalism that I think is really harmful where people people have, they, they think women should be able to choose, but I could never do that. And then when they maybe find themselves in the situation where they do need to do it. They feel like it's happening outside of whatever the 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 common experience or whatever the ordinary um, whatever is happening with everyone else. They don't position it as as what is the reality of abortion. And um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's also about. What? I think money is a big part. I think people don't like to talk about money 
And I think that the admission mm. of a person that you cannot afford another child is something that is very hard for people to digest. And that's one mm -hmm. thing that this book does. I mean, it talks about, I talk about marriage. I talk about sex. I talk about grief and loss. Um, we talk about work, which I think is work. so, so important. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and money. I was talking to a friend about this today. I was like, oh, and I think she's here right now. I, I said, what friend do you have that has not had a conversation with one of her girlfriends about their husband not doing great with money? A lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. That is an admission that I make that I think uh, it's an American issue. You know, the credit card debt, the ability mm -hmm. to make it, the piecing things together, you know, and that's not a judgment on my husband necessarily. It's a judgment on no one. I mean, it's just the way things are. It's the way that we structure. Mm -hmm. But I think too, that when I was asked, why you want to do this? And I said, it's because I'm making $55,000 a year and my rent is $2,100 a month that they just couldn't deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, I mean, that's another, uh, I love how abortion is this, this like phenomenal nexus of all of our taboos of money and sex and religion and politics. <laughs> it's like, it's all exploding there somehow. Um, but yeah, I mean, people, that is the reality that is a, very common for middle class Americans. Um, and it, it is another just swamp that no one wants to talk about. So people think they're alone in it or that they that they don't realize that other people are going through it, too. Um, and and we feel so much shame about it that it just is really, really hard to write about it or talk about it. And so, I don't know, thank you again for being so willing and so honest. Um, I just think it's a very, very brave book. And, um, and I think, is it time for questions now? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you both okay. so much. There's a, there's a great question already in the, um, in the chat here from Noah Fowler. He says, hey, Krista, thank you so much for bringing this book to the world. Can you speak a little bit to working as an educator in the place that denied you access to reproductive choice? <laughs> How does your experience make it easier or harder to stay invested in a place like West Virginia? My experience doesn't make it any harder to be invested in a place like West Virginia because, in fact, you know, uh, so many states have these sorts of issues with access. And, um, you know, West Virginia is one of those places. And I, I, I'm, I, ha I no longer live in the state of West Virginia. I do still teach in the state of West Virginia. I'm on Zoom right now teaching. Um, but my investment is high because I care about what happens to my female students. I, I feel like I'm, I have to advocate for them. I, I think that's part of my life's work, to be honest, is to advocate for women. And I'm able to do that in the classroom right now in the state of West Virginia. I also feel like having had this experience uh, gives me intimate knowledge about what it means to live there. And I feel, I, I think that if I, if, I just, if I decided to leave and go someplace else, I, there would be a considerable amount of heartbreak for me because of the duty I feel to the state of West Virginia. I mean, we've all probably been there. You have a hard experience and it doesn't necessarily drive you some, from something. It kind of tethers you to it. And I think there will always be a part of me that feels left there in that way. And I'm not, I'm not ready to leave it. And I, I also feel like it is incredibly important, especially in places like Appalachia, that um, women citizens with direct experience um, in Appalachia remain there to help out the, you know, help out people that are, you know, are going to be there, you know, maybe for the duration of their lives. I don't know if that answers your question, Noah Fowler. <laughs> So we've got a comment in the chat from Joanne. Um, she says, thank you for your compelling account of how our healthcare policies fail mothers and ultimately families. It reveals the gap between the reality of women's perceived bodily autonomy and the actual fact of being pregnant in a red state. 
your courageous work is a claiming of women's power, um, of our determination to control our own narratives and ultimately our lives. Thank you for writing this much needed book. And I'd actually love to tack a question onto that. Did you, I, as I said, I'm, I'm only part way into the book. Um, in the course of writing this, did you wind up researching policies and the situation in other states beyond West Virginia and what the situation is for pregnant people in those places? I did, I did, yeah. I mean, the, the, this, re, this book was founded on the idea of research. I had written it first because West Virginia was about, I, I'd started the project because West Virginia was about to pass something called Amendment 1, which would ban Medicaid funded uh, abortion in the state and it did pass. And so that is no longer an option. And the majority of women seeking abortion in the state of West Virginia are, are on Medicaid. And now, you know, as a result, I mean, I, I don't know what that means for the numbers for people who are actually able to access abortion. But, um, you know, I, West Virginia is a microcosm and it's, you know, it's a starting point for what I knew was a national disaster. And as a writer of nonfiction memoir specifically, I knew that I needed to attach myself to the experience that I had in order for other people to feel it viscerally, but that it is a reality across the nation. And I researched it deeply. And there are many, many pages of researched writing that just made it that that went to the cutting room floor because, you know, the it's kind of, I mean, I don't, I, my editor could speak to this too, um, but you know, it's like, how do I make a page turning book about reproductive health care? <laughs> you do it with all arming yourself with all of the knowledge about what it means to curtail reproductive health care while grounding it in an individual story in a plot forward way. And so I used the knowledge when I, when I, you know, I armed myself with that knowledge and used it as often as I could in the book to help educate people as they were reading. There's a question here um, from Julie. Uh, the women I know who have considered abortion tell me that it was the ability to choose that allowed them to make peace with the arrival of an unexpected child. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that, this feelings, uh, feeling based on your situation? I don't know, but I imagine that had I been given the option to choose for myself that I wouldn't have had the panic that I did. I wouldn't have felt so stuffed down and contained in this way that really made me feel absolutely caged and unprepared to mother another person. And, uh, you know, it goes back to that idea of confidence. If you give somebody the ability to make their own decisions, they can enter into their lives uh, with a little bit more certainty and a lot more agency. And um, I didn't, you know, I arrived at the end of my pregnancy with Keats and I really, and I, as the mother of two children already, I, you know, I breastfed my daughters that, you know, as long as I possibly could years in Josephine's case, um, I had to stop because I was pregnant with Keats when I had, I, you know, when I was breastfeeding Iris, but I really did have that baby not feeling that I had the grounding that I'd had for the pregnancies before, which having been a mother already was kind of maddening, but I can only imagine that had I gotten the money together had I figured out my, you know, had I been able to align my life in a way that felt like I could add a child and that I decided for myself instead of watching that clock run out and be gaslit all the way through it, that it would have been much easier at the end to actually advocate for him when he wasn't doing well, which was incredibly hard for me because I'd already had that voice snatched from me. There's a great question from Catherine in the chat, um, just saying, perhaps piggybacking off the continue question. Um, as someone who lived in West Virginia, I know that res residents are rightly sensitive about how the state is portrayed in popular media and often bristle about any negative representations. Mm -hmm. How did you navigate the challenge of telling your own truth and very real experience, knowing that it might be seen as a betrayal by residents? Uh, with a great amount of pain and care. And I don't, you know, I don't, I did the best that I could and I don't, you know, I'll never, I'll never know if the best that I could is good enough, but I did the best that I could, but I, you know, I did not write this book without the awareness that that is an issue and one that I too, as a, 
resident of West Virginia had felt. Um, my student, and it might even be the Catherine asking this question, <laughs> I'm not sure, I think it's that Catherine, um, had written an essay in my class about um, a domestic violence incident next door to her and um, the fear that accompanied that and the uncertainty about living in Morgantown and just the description of it. And she published it and I was horrified and not, not the person that I wished I could be at the end because, you know, at, you know, now <laughs> I, um, I, t I was I was embarrassed. I worried that the representation of Appalachia in that way would stop people from coming to our program. And it's really one of the great shames of my life, to be honest. It was I was a failure as a teacher at that moment because I was protecting something instead of protecting, you know, I was protecting Appalachia instead of protecting my student. Um, and that's really hard, but for me as a teacher and you know but it was a it's a good moment for me as i go forward i would never do something like that again of course but there was a great deal of risk in writing this book because i knew that some of my colleagues might not agree with it i knew that it could cost me friends and in fact it did i mean that that did happen people were unhappy with the way that i represented west virginia but you know the, and as an outsider who's representing West Virginia, I grew up in New York State um, and I was not born in West Virginia. I do in fact have family ties to West Virginia, but I'm still an outsider of West Virginia in that way. But, you know, in order to write this book, I had to ask myself the question, you know, what does it mean to be from a place? And I just kept thinking, well, if you give birth in a place and you educate students in that place and your children are from that place, you get to claim that place in a way. And I was not going to not write this book because I was afraid that people would think that it didn't belong to me. The state of, I love the state of West Virginia and I have devoted a portion of my life to the state of West Virginia. And I had to just give myself permission to do this book and write this book uh, even though it was uncomfortable. And I'm sure people will have feelings. <laughs> So we are close to out of time. Um, so I thought I could ask a last question to sort of wrap things up this evening. Um, today is your publication day. Congratulations, very exciting. Um, and you had, we alluded earlier to the New York Times Review and some things that are great and then some things that they talked about that were not really the point of the book. Uh -huh. um, I wonder, you know, obviously it's probably been a pretty fraught time waiting for this book to go out into the world and people to start reading it. Um, are there any sort of greatest hopes and greatest dreams about what this book will mean uh, now that it's out there launched into the world? Well, I mean, obviously there's the great hope that I will reach uh, women who are out there and worried about what's going to happen to them and feel alone in this country and for them to know that they are, sh they have, they're having an experience that is not uncommon and uh, is in fact not shameful. I mean, that's the number one goal, of course. Um, but I've thought a lot about it. I mean, I think the ways in which I, you know, I feel that this book is about possibility have occurred to me this week, especially as we've seen the his this historic election take place and what it means to mobilize in this country. I mean, I guess I had a very busy day and I did not watch the news in the way that I did. And I, I think there's some noise <laughs> about what's happening with our election. I know there is, but um, I, you know, I, I, I wrote this book really quickly because I needed, you know, it was asked that I have it delivered for an election season when people were going to be debating uh, reproductive health care and we thought it would have the most impact. And I am a mother of three children and they were all so little then. And I wrote a book in four and a half months. <laughs> um, I don't know how, I really don't. <laughs> it, I was possessed by, you know, I was possessed by the idea that I needed to reach people. But that act has convinced me that we can do anything. We can do anything. And I, <laughs> I, I, yeah. I want people to I want people to know that. So, you know, if I have a sentence or two that's not perfect, that's fine because the book is there and it will reach people that need it. But 
I want other people to know that they have that in them too. You know, after four years of feeling like we have been stuffed down, we still have the ability to live our desires. They're right there. We just have to take them. So that's my hope. Krista Merritt, um, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. And uh, I really appreciate it, but I'd like to share one last comment from the chat before we uh, close off tonight. And that is uh, from uh, Jane Ann Phillips. She says, um, thank you for your courage, Krista. The anti-abortion movement changed its name to the pro-life movement. Yet the life they advocate for is solely the life of the fetus whose heartbeat, as you point out in the book, is not a heartbeat. There is no advocacy or care for those who are already alive. The woman who must decide how to deal with an unplanned pregnancy, the children whose mother who must navigate in red states, compromised health care, curtailed futures. As someone who grew up in West Virginia, went to university there and chose to leave because I did not want to raise my children there, I feel that your book advocates for West Virginia, advocates for possibility and change. Um, this has been a terrific event. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much to Krista Paravani and Merritt Tierce. This really has been phenomenal. Thank you audience for being here and for your lovely questions and comments. Um, please join us for more Northshire Live events. We have Thomas Frank, um, author of What's the Matter with Kansas, um, joining us tomorrow night for his new book, The People Know. So come on back and we'll see you all again. Thank you so much everyone. Okay. Have a great evening. Good night. Thank you. All right, take care.